Hello everyone and welcome back to Realism Over All Sandbox and Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1. In this video I am going to do some experiments with the Shinkansen space plane. So I've made some other systems recently. There's the Shuttle 2, Shuttle Mark 2, and uh, we also have the Lex. And of course Starship is still hanging out. But before all of these there was the Shinkansen space plane, which is this. And the idea here, and I did all the math in the video, uh, was to create a system where there are two identical-ish space planes. One is completely filled with fuel. Uh, there's no cockpit or anything. There's no people inside. It's automated. And it'll eventually fly back, glide back to a landing. And so ideally it launched from like Brownsville and then land on the Gulf Coast somewhere. And the other side is a space plane with a cargo bay and people inside and everything. Altogether on the launch pad, this system is about as heavy as a Falcon 9. It's running on methane and oxygen. Currently, this side, the carrier plane, is feeding fuel into the space plane. And once it decouples, then of course the space plane will be on its own internal fuel. And the key to the design is that the space plane can be refueled by one flight of either Starship or SLS, Block 1B. So it's about 100 tons of fuel over there. And its primary mission is to transfer people from Earth orbit to lunar orbit. And they'll come back and just repeat over and over and over again. So it's not mainly meant to be a Earth orbit system. And it's only meant to come back down from Earth orbit for repairs. And I figure that it can do this cycle repeatedly over and over and over again for a while uh, because we have the X-37 as an example and the X-37 hangs out in orbit for more than a year so we know that a space plane can hang out in orbit for more than a year and that is the goal of this so a pod like Dragon 2 will dock with it, transfer the crew into it and then the crew will use it to go and of course a starship or SLS will refuel it and we have the boosters go off. I added the boosters because and they're supposed to be recoverable, they have floats and parachutes and everything but I added the boosters because its cargo capacity wasn't quite enough so I wanted to give it some additional margin. When I designed it, I designed it a little bit too tightly. Basically it barely got into orbit with its dry mass so that's a bit annoying and other features that I should mention are the special vacuum engines that we have here with extendable nozzle. So the nozzle is retracted when it lights on the ground and only extends while in flight. This was an idea that was uh, proposed for the space shuttle main engines, uh, especially when they were thinking of using the space shuttle main engines also on the boosters, on liquid boosters. So, but anyway, that seemed to be the best option so that we don't have to create two different kinds of engines. Uh, on the carrier plane side, we have five engines and it shuts them down as it uh, depletes of fuel. So, yeah, you saw, see that two are off now of the five. And then there's two main engines on the, on the space plane side. These engines are basically what you would get if you turn the Merlin 1D into a methane oxygen engine. So they have about a 1000 kilonewton thrust range and they throttle a bit. They're gas generator engines. They're not as efficient as Raptor engines. And uh, though the nozzle helps. So the thing is, I'm not entirely satisfied with its low earth orbit capabilities. It can, we've used it to do stuff. Uh, like we've refueled it and then it would transfer out to uh, high earth orbit to a ron uh, to rendezvous with uh, ion engine ship to transfer to Mars. The cargo bay space would be used for additional habitat space, recreational areas if you will, or science experiments. Not really suited to carrying heavy payloads right now. But this is the way it was designed. The question is can I change it up a little bit. Right now it's fully recoverable. Benefits over Orion are obvious. It, it keeps, it recovers its second stage and its OMS, its uh, service module. So it doesn't discard those. Uh, that didn't work out quite right. Off. Okay. 
So off goes the carrier plane. It reserves some fuel in uh, nose tanks. It's got nose RCS tanks that are in reserve. So it's not completely out of fuel. It's very hard to control this without the script, unfortunately. Each of these systems are sort of like different Boeing airliners in my mind. So this is more like the eventual 737, not the original 737, which was sort of low range, the 737-100. This is more like 200 and beyond, where it had a good transcontinental range. And um, the Shuttle 2, Shuttle Mark 2, is sort of like a 727, shorter range, about the same capacity of people, but shorter range. The the Lex is sort of like a 767-ish, whereas the Starship is more like a 747, in my mind. So, they, they all have different requirements and capabilities. Obviously, you need to do a whole lot more refueling for a Starship. A uh, Shuttle Mark II can be launched directly to the moon without any in-Earth orbit refueling. So that's its benefit. This still needs one refueling in-Earth orbit. And, uh, but it'll just be one flight of Starship to refuel it. Lex needs two, and then Starship itself needs too many. <laughs> too many for me to actually do. So, anyway. And of course, this system, uh, it's going a little bit lopsided. 446 by 160. So you can see how tight it is, even with the boosters, 220 meters per second. We do have a refueling contraption in the bay, though. So, but that's uh, like a minimum cargo. It's uh, just a piston with a refueling port on it, so that if we ever sent Starship up to refuel it... Starship is definitely good at refueling things. That's why this uses methane and oxygen. Starship has a pretty big back... No matter how you try and get Starship over to this, we definitely need an extendable docking port in order to get the fuel in. Otherwise, it's going to be really inconvenient. So, yeah, that's what it has in the bay. That's all it has in the bay. So, yep, this is perhaps a little bit more optimized for a moon trip. Maybe Shuttle 2 is a bit better. Uh, we will see. But first, I have an alternate method to get Shinkansen to orbit. And we will take a look at that. By the way, Shinkansen is sized specifically to wrap around its tanks. So, if it wasn't this size, the carrier plane wouldn't be able to contain enough fuel in order to do its job. It doesn't get very fast, I mean, it gets to 2,000 meters per second, which is pretty fast, but um, not so fast that it's going to be hard for it to come back down safely. But the, the huge surface area on the bottom here is beneficial for air braking back from the moon, so it doesn't have to use its fuel to slow down from the moon, and it can come back from the moon in two error breaking passes if it doesn't use fuel and of course if it does use fuel then it can air break in one pass anyway let's see the alternate method for launching Shinkansen that I've come up with you might have guessed what was coming this is Shinkansen on the Unix rocket still a fully reusable system the Unix rocket is the Raptor 9 first stage and you can see we've got the grid fins, we intend to bring it back down, probably on a barge actually, not on, or a drone ship, not back to return to launch site, because this will get pretty far out. Unlike the carrier plane, it has a lot more thrust, has a lot more fuel, and so it's going to get further out. And drone ship, it'll have to be, it'll have to do, uh, save some extra fuel to slow down and everything. And the thrust is serious. I mean, when you think about it, the carrier plane only had five engines that were basically Merlin-1Ds converted to methane and oxygen. So that's only 5,000 kilonewtons of thrust. Here, now we have like 18,000 uh, 18, kilonewtons of thrust, 18 megatons, uh, meganewtons, sorry, 18 meganewtons. So that's way, way, way more thrust than the carrier plane had. As with the carrier plane, it's has to be able to cross feed into the space plane otherwise uh, otherwise the booster is going to get way too far out to be able to save itself it'll just burn up so we need it to use some of its fuel to keep 
this side topped off and run the engines on the surface so that it can it doesn't go too far out before ending its job so that's the goal we'll have to do a lot of throttling we'll have to shut down some of the engines just like we did on the space plane but let's see how it works I've action grouped the engines so that uh, the center one on here is 10 uh, two other ones are on nine and then eight we'll definitely shut off these uh, six that are on action group eight first and then we'll probably run the other three until it needs to separate off and we'll reserve enough fuel for it to land on some sort of ship hopefully <laughs> that's uh, that's a theory anyway let's see how this works okay so throttle up and I'll just control it manually this time because I think there's enough thrust on this side to control it <laughs> um, so that it won't be too wobbly we'll see SAS on throttle is up and ignition and launch so again right now on the space plane side the nozzles are retracted now is there any benefit to this over Lex, it, it's it's a tough one because Lex only requires two refueling trips. This requires one. This looks sort of cooler. I feel it looks sort of slick, and I don't know if I don't think Lex will be able to air brake quite as well back from the moon. This is probably still better at the air braking deal. But it can't carry the same cargo as Lex, obviously. Lex has uh, greater tanks, it's got more room for cargo. So last time we, and I should probably throttle down here, we're at the speed of sound and frankly we have a lot of thrust. So last time we had 220 meters per second left. We'll see how much the space plane has left over when we get into orbit. We didn't put any bo extra boosters on, so there's that. Remember, it is not actually 50%. None of these engines thrall all the way down. Okay, so this is about the height for the nozzle extensions. So the nozzles are extending, and we check that we get the better ISP. We do. Okay. I'll have to keep an eye on pitch as well as the time to apoapsis. A little bit inconvenient. Once the pitch maxes out, we have to turn off the engines to keep the balance. Okay, shutting down those six engines to keep the balance here. And we should throw up. So there's one third of the engines active on here. So I figured that we were reserving 20 seconds. I'm figuring that we should reserve, uh, let's say, a little bit less than a minute because there's also these engines drawing fuel. So maybe 50 seconds. Or when that pitch maxes out too much. <laughs> maybe. Maybe that's what we'll go for. Or we could shut down two more, but now I don't know if it's producing enough thrust to warrant keeping it, actually. Alright, yeah, let's just uh, shut it off there and separate. Off it goes. Hopefully it is recoverable. I mean, if we take a look over here... Oh, I can't see. Uh, about 3,000 meters per second. I didn't really want them on on, but well, now it's going off into the distance. I needed to turn them on to see how much delta V we had there. So about 3,000 meters per second should be enough to land on a barge, or slow down and land on a barge here. One would hope. Okay, about to make orbit. Bit lopsided, but all right. Uh, 320 by 160 and we have a thousand five hundred meters per second left now while we're here uh, and we get a lot of that 
Uh, I think is the are the nose tanks still? I think the nose tanks are still there. Yeah, they're still full. So it's including that. If we locked the nose tanks, uh, we only have 880. But as usual, the last little bit of fuel counts for a whole lot of delta v. But all right, so let's see if we can top it off with starship. How about that? While we are here, I don't know that. It's all about whether the RCS of Starship is nimble enough to dock with this thing. That is not an immediately obvious thing. This is a propellant-only docking port, by the way, if you've never seen this one before. Okay, we're chasing right after it. I'm launching directly after it, so our inclination is not too far off anyway. So hopefully not too bad. Throttle up, SAS is on, and ignition is loud. I need to consolidate these engines into clusters. Anyway, launch. So, up front we are actually carrying about 120 tons of methane and oxygen in a locked tank. So that is our cargo, and we will see how it goes. Considering I still have 37 engines on here at the bottom, it's not the performance is not that bad. Okay, going through max Q. Things are looking good. We are getting the target 75 mega newtons that Elon said in a tweet, and of course, if we upgrade the engines, if they upgrade the engines to their targets, then we can put fewer engines, but we've got the 37 engines because that's what we need to meet the target thrust. Just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to save 20 seconds again for return to launch site. Alright, so separation and ignition. Okay, so again, the question is whether we can get this 120 ton payload to orbit. Oh, let's lock it. <laughs> it's using it. Don't do that. Of course, we can use it if necessary, if it turns out that we can't get the 120 tons to orbit with the engines rated as they are. Oh, I should have uh, action grouped the sea level engines. I'll just turn them off manually. You'll be fine. You can see where I put the docking port. So I put it on a piston just in case that'll help. Or maybe having two robotic parts like that will just cause the Kraken to strike and everything will go awry. We'll see. Whoa, a little bit vigorous. Oh, I need to turn off the sea level engines. No, uh, just above one, one G of thrust, so it wasn't too late to turn off the sea level engines. It's about the right time. Okay, and shut down. We want to be in a lower orbit to catch up, and so it's going to be in a higher orbit. We're just above the atmosphere, and we've got 300 meters per second, so... Let's see if we can rendezvous with 300 meters per second to deliver this 120 tons of fuel. A propellant, I should say. So it's over here. And we're over here. I don't know if I need to turn on the fuel cells. Probably not. Sort of funny that this has the airplane icon and the Shinkansen has the pod icon. Okay, that'll be close enough. So just about 60 meters per second here and 50 meter per second relative velocity there. So that shouldn't be a problem. Let's activate our RCS and turn to the node. Docking is going to be more of a problem. I haven't actually tried to dock Starship, I don't think. <laughs> so this is going to be new. Probably this burn in real life would be done just with the RCS. Ooh, we don't need them actually turning that much. <laughs> That's awkward. 
And very, very brief ignition, hopefully. Ah, that's, that's not too bad. Controllable. Okay, the rest with RCS. The podless version would have better capabilities to lower orbit, of course. We're carrying a pod here. There is a podless version in my real rockets pack. It has the window, but it doesn't have the actual mass of the pod, so. Okay, and ignition. Okay, that's pretty good. All right, now the tough part though. All right, well, there it is. Okay, well, I forgot about this thing's beached whale roll. That's gonna take some time to stop. That's one reason why the Shuttle Mark II ended up with outboard RCS ports on its wings. Great. Well, this is sort of what I was afraid of. This sort of dance that they have to do. The trouble is the 200 meter range thing where stuff is not as accurate and you can't target docking ports outside of a 200 meter range. Otherwise, I'd like to start these maneuvers at a greater range, but probably would be easier to maneuver the space plane. It's lighter. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, this is really not working very well. That's still rolling. Uh, just off. Okay, I think it's doing bad shuttle-y things. I had trouble with the shuttle too, once upon a time. So I'm gonna try and do it the way I did with the shuttle. I mean, Starship with uh, full cargo load is about 220 to 250 tons. So docking it to another starship I mean, it's almost like trying to dock two international space stations together. Not quite, but... I feel like I need to put more thrusters on here. I think I missed a set. I missed one pair that we actually sort of need. Okay, we'll call that good enough in that direction. Uh, it's the usual nasty sort of thing where trying to use thrusters in one axis has effects in other axes. So we have to be careful. Okay, now controlling from the docking port finally. Hopefully it's not going to mess about too much. At this point we'll just try and smush them together and see what happens. Oh, please let there be magnetism. <laughs> A little bit. Yeah, oh no. Oh no. Adverse reaction. Oh god. Um. No. Okay. Please let this be the solution. Maybe we we're just too close to Starship's own collider and it was messing up with the docking port or something. Okay, we've connected finally. All right. Uh, well, let's get this contraption into daylight so we can see what's going on. So this is what it looks like. Sort of does look like Shinkansen is docked to fuel depot, doesn't it? Okay, no, 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 no. Let's just not. Um... Okay, so we let's just open the hatch so I can see that. So there's the locked tank. So 120 tons. And uh, here we've still got some fuel. So actually I'm going to drain the fuel first. We'll retain the RCS fuel. There's RCS fuel up front. Okay, so that's all gone. 
and so out out it's not quite enough to fully fuel this if we had kept that little bit of fuel it would have been you can see the center of mass shifting as we transfer the fuels propellants okay so that tank is drained We'll see how much Delta V Starship has after this. So, ek. undock. Okay, not Starship. Be sure to control from the docking port. And then back off. Uh, oh, SAS as well. Okay, so now controlling from here, we see we have nearly 6,000 meters per second after it's been topped off. That's for Shinkansen. So 3,200 to head to the moon, 800 to capture or so, maybe a few hundred to rendezvous. And then on the way back, you'd have an air breaking pass that kills about 1,500 meters per second. And if necessary, you can use another 1,500 meters per second to remove the rest of the difference between the orbit and low Earth orbit. Okay, so that can just kill rotation. And over here, what we have left is 261 meters per second. That's probably not quite enough to deorbit and land. It's enough to deorbit. We need about 100 meters per second to deorbit. But then after that, actually making the touchdown, uh, probably I'd want... 400 so i want 500 total might be a good amount to reserve so it's tight but doable do i want to dock things together like this a lot no no it's really hard <laughs> because of the rcs arrangement if it was a normal pod then it could have rcs on the bottom uh, where it'd be more convenient and so, uh, if we had RCS that could poke through the heat tiles if that was allowed but the for in both cases I've placed the RCS ports so they're not likely to be damaged by plasma on the way back through re-entry and trying to avoid that for both Starship and Shinkansen means that their RCS systems are inherently imbalanced around the center of mass uh, though in Shinkansen's case, I think we'd be we'd have been a little bit better off if uh, I think uh, there's at least one pair of RCS thrusters I could add. But you can see the rear RCS thrusters are especially problematic here because they're they're in this block here, and this they have to avoid hitting the control surfaces and the wings as well. So you can sort of see that it's at a very oblique angle here too. Yeah, it's weird. Anyway, so well that's a little bit of experimentation. Managed to get it done, but it was it was a problem. Anyway, so that's one thing. We'll see what else we can do. With that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.